Hello and welcome back to New Every Day. My name's Carrie. And my name's Jen. And on today's show, we're going to talk about dragons, beasts, and the beauty of God. got mad skills now hone them learn new skills or improve your existing ones with online video tutorials and training from lynda.com through our special link at cat5.tv slash lynda learn software technology creative and business skills you can use today to help you achieve your professional goals join today and start learning We'll give you this chance to try it absolutely free with unlimited access to all of the courses. Sign up now for free, cat5.tv slash Linda. All right, welcome back to New Every Day. So glad that you joined us again. Uh, we are continuing mm -hmm. to look at the book of Revelation. Dragons, Beasts, and the Beauty of God. Just the thought of having to read about that kind of makes me feel a little uncomfortable, which is what we talked about on our first show of the book of Revelation. How it can be totally, you can be put off by the fact that there's all these symbols, there's all these different meanings that we really don't always have a good handle of. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, it can be kind of daunting. Daunting. To read even. Well, there's... A beast and then the beast has horns and then there's a there's two women and one woman who's pregnant and the dragon is coming and wants the baby but she's given wings and lifted off to heaven or and then there's another woman who sits on another beast and she is like scary evil. and that beast has horns and three horns and then the middle horn gets big and then it falls off and then there's another one and it's very confusing or it seems to be that way so confusing and scary and because we don't know and when we don't know Whenever ignorance comes in, and I know ignorance is such a harsh word, but whenever we don't know, we tend to draw back or we tend to be afraid or we don't understand. We're like, I don't know what to do with this. What am I supposed to do with this? And what's, I think that's where the enemy actually wants to come in and cause all sorts of problems. And so one of the reasons um, why we're talking specifically about beasts and dragons and the glory of God today is specifically because when Jesus revealed this message to John to write down they would have actually understood what the symbols meant for the first for the most part because it the revelation says um, it is for so people will know what is happening now so the question is well, what was happening now and what will happen in the future? So the question is, well, what was happening during that time when Jesus gave this revelation to John? So that's one of the key things. Um, that is good Bible scholarship, actually, is to go digging to say, well, what was going on around this time when Jesus gave this revelation to John? Why was that so important for Jesus to say, you know, this is what's happening? So what was happening, I guess, is the question. If we were to go get in our time machine and go back to this period in time in the book of Revelation was happening, do we know? What what was the... So what was the landscape at that time? Yeah. I'm asking you. You're asking me. <laughs> she had that question. The questioning looked like to say, Jen, are you going to answer that question? <laughs> well, Rome was in control. So just like when Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus, was the Roman emperor in charge. Now, the Roman emperors and, and his, um, the country that they oversaw believed that the emperors were gods. Hmm. That they, so you needed to bow down and worship them. Hmm. That might pose a, a problem for Christians. Right. Who worship only God. Who worship only God. Who will not bow to another. Which sort of goes back to what we talked about Daniel in one of our previous shows. So Christians believe that there is one God and he alone is to be worshipped. And so the emperors did not like this because they felt that they were usurping them. Okay. Um, 
And so basically, we often hear of the terrible, terrible persecution mm -hmm. that was taking place during that time. Um, that's where the Colosseum, the Col gladiators, the lions. Yes. So the Christians were literally thrown to the lions. Now we actually saw that in Daniel as well, right? With King right. Darius. But and it wasn't for sport. That was a means of execution. Yes. This was a means of execution for the Christians, but it was for sport for uh, the people to watch. Which, you know, even as we say that, just breaks my heart that people would, that people could be so mean to watch another person being killed by animals or even pitted against each other to the death. And yet that was the culture of the day. And so this was going on, like often they were thrown to the lions or wild beasts or they were set on fire or crucified and just tortured because mm -hmm. they would not bow. Right. They, w they would only bow to God alone. And so when Jesus is writing this, he's actually writing it to comfort his people. Because um, what's interesting is chapter 4 begins with, um, in verse 4, before the throne, there was something that looked like a sea of glass, clear like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living creatures with eyes all over them in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like a calf, the third was like the face of, of, had the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of these four living creatures has six wings and covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He was, He is, and He is coming. These living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever. Then the 24 elders bow down before the one who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They put their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, You receive, to receive glory and honor and power, because you made all things. Everything exists and was made because you wanted it. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus... <coughs> And this is why I get such comfort. Jesus sees what's going on with his people. Right. And so he's like, I got to get them a message. So in midst of all the suffering, it's like he, uh, he <laughs> beams down this message or beams up John to see this vision of what is happening, to say God is in control. God is in control. Yes. And even though, you know, and it's interesting that he chooses that there's beasts with these eyes and I you know I don't even begin to imagine what that looks like because it you know that can kind of put me off a little bit but the fact is they are bowing beasts are bowing to God who right. sits on the throne the 24 elders are bowing and they're saying holy 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 they are acknowledging who really is in control and even when John wrote this he was ostracized he was sent away to the island of Patmos Yes. Because of his faith in Christ. So he was isolated on the island. Yeah. And that's where, when he received this message from Jesus. And so that must have been hopeful for him to actually see the throne of God. Yes. Like I just... That is why Revelation is a book of hope. And the enemy does not want us to read it because he doesn't want us to get hopeful. To see that in spite of the suffering and everything that's going on, he doesn't want us to know that God is really in control. Yeah. That he's going to work all these things out because he doesn't want us to get our eyes on Jesus. And that's one thing I noticed all the way through the book was there would be this really kind of scary part so or fearful part. Like even the letters to the seven churches can kind of be like, oh no, is that me? Right? And it can be yeah. a negative. Yeah. But then right after it, let's look at Jesus. Let's look at the throne room of God and see you know, get our eyes focused on who really is in control. And all the way throughout the book, this is what happens. There's like this glimpse of reality and then a glimpse of God. A glimpse of what's going to happen, glimpse of God. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, this is what's happening, but God But is turn your eyes back to me. Yes. It's so easy to get distracted. And I think of um, when John the Baptist was taken to prison mm. and yes. even there john the baptist okay like yeah. this guy was in the wilderness he was um 
the cousin yeah. of Jesus, yeah. right? So he was born, he was told by God, he went in the wilderness, lived there, he preached about God, brought people to God, brought them to repentance, yeah. baptized them. That was his life and then was brought into prison. Yes. He actually saw the Spirit of God descending on Jesus like a dove. Okay, that's some confirmation right there. Yeah. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet when he was in prison, he sent a messenger to Jesus saying, are you the Messiah or should we, we be waiting for someone else? John the Baptist, in his suffering, right? Yeah. Started to question and wonder if God is in control and are you really the Messiah? Are you really Jesus? Yeah. And Jesus wrote back, I know. tell John what you have seen and heard. Yes. That the blind see, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor are hearing the good news. Yes. Blessed are they who do not fall, fall away on account of me. Mm -hmm. We can get lost in the suffering. Because what happens when we suffer, so often we get our eyes from here, to focusing on God, to here, focusing on us. And there's no hope in me. Mm -hmm. There's no hope in me. Like, if I'm left to my own devices, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bad news. Yeah. But as soon as I turn my eyes on Jesus, wow. Even when um, the world, it doesn't make sense to do so. Yes. Is all the more reason when we need to do it, when you're stranded on an island, when you're in prison. And we know that there are many Christians all over the world yes. who are in prison right yes. now. And we're just praying for you. Yes. And yes. they are struggling more than we could ever know. I know. And we... We need to turn our eyes back to Him. We need to turn our eyes back to Him. The world says, pull yourself up by your own metaphysical bootstraps. Dig yeah. down deep. But there's nothing there. No. There's nothing there. The hope is in Jesus Christ alone. And and I think that's what we need to focus on when we read this. Like the the Jews... The, the Christians were suffering, and Jesus is like, keep your eyes on me. And so when he gives all of these symbols, we can actually be like, oh, right? What's this mean? What does this mean? But yeah. we, in order to find the meaning and the hope behind it, yeah. and we've talked about this a little bit, we actually have to do some digging. Yeah. We have to, okay, because the Jew, the Christians at the time would have known what a lot of these symbols meant. And so it it's like me saying... Um, when Carrie and I first um, decided to share an apartment together, I would say, um, what does that have to do with the price of eggs? Oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm not quite sure what she's going to say here. <laughs> and I'd be like, what? What does that Never heard that saying before. And I actually had to explain to her what what does that mean? Or just All that in a bag of chips. All that in a bag of chips. <laughs> or a stitch in time saves nine. That was just last week. And I had to... I know. I. She likes old sayings. I like. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not new, or else I'd know them. Oh. <clears throat> Carry on. Anyways, so yes. you had to explain it. You had to, you had to do some digging and explain it to me. Yeah, in order for her to understand what I was saying. And that's exactly what is happening here. Like the, the the Christians knew what those symbols meant. And so it is our responsibility then to get digging. out our, I love that phrase, our metaphysical shovels <laughs> and do some digging. Okay, what did those symbols mean to the people who have been receiving them? And it's like, because God uses things all the way throughout the Bible to convey his message, but in a hidden way way yeah and there's a proverb that mm -hmm. says it's the glory of god to conceal a matter but the glory of kings to find it out so we have this great joy to see the depth of the word of god and that it's not yeah. yes we can read the story of jesus and he healed the, the person with leprosy and we can see right there on the page jesus healed him we learn about who jesus is and yet when you dig deeper into scripture it reveals so much more so something that i i um learned about was in Genesis chapter 5. If you want to go right on back to the beginning of the Bible, there is a very long genealogy there. 
And it says, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man. He made him in the, in the likeness mm -hmm. of God. He created them male and female. Then it goes on to say, um, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. And he begot Seth. And then Seth begot Enosh and Enosh begot so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. So all down this, this big long list of genealogies. And even as you're reading that, I'm looking at the camera going, I'm gonna read that all because that's what people do when they hear genealogies they're like I think you know what I'm just gonna skip over that and I would often skip over it until one day I learned something very interesting that originally the um, Genesis was writ written in Hebrew and if you look at the meaning of the names mm -hmm. there's actually a message from the Lord hidden in the meaning of the names so if you look at the Hebrew um, name Adam means man Seth means appointed Enosh means mortal, Kenan means sorrow, Mahalalel means the blessed God, Jared means shall come down, Enoch means teaching, Methuselah his death shall bring, Lamech means the despairing, Noah means rest or comfort. And if you look at the meanings of those names, it actually tells the story of redemption. So let me read you the English translation of those Hebrew names. Okay. Man appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. Interesting. The meaning of the names tells a story. And you can find that resource if you go to our website, um, neweveryday.tv, and click the link to khouse.org. You can find all this information about how to do some digging. But Jen, here in the Old Testament was this hidden gem of the mercy and the plan of God that he was in control, even yes. in Genesis. And we can trace that all the way through the Bible. And now in Revelation, we can see that he is still in control. He is still in control. Even in these hidden numbers. And I know, which can be so overwhelming and daunting. Like when you, we talked about this in the last show, that number seven means completeness. But you did some digging about some other numbers too, right? Well, the number 12 is like the 12 tribes or the 12... Uh, disciples mm -hmm. and um, the number four can often mean the four corners of the earth or all of the earth um, thousand when we see you know it says a thousand or a thousand it just means there's a lot of people okay <laughs> like so thousands we're a like lot. really like exactly 2,000 or exactly like 144 is that an exact number and it seems pretty specific it seems pretty sp specific until you understand that Greek and Hebrew writing, like, they would round up, just like we do. Like, we wouldn't say, well, it was, like, 14,932. You'd probably say it's it's around 15,000 people. And you see that throughout the Old Testament, right? There's, you know, sometimes it says there are 257, but when they get into the thousands, it's often a rounded number. But what it means is that there's a lot of people. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And God knows the exact number and sometimes there are exact numbers for reasons so yes yeah yes like the number six 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 mm -hmm. um and i don't know why god chose the number six 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 to represent the mark of the beast those who would follow after him but see everybody knows like even people who don't know jesus they're like six that's six, a bad six. number yeah you don't, don't put that on your license plate yeah yeah bad luck bad 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 yeah <laughs> and uh so we can get caught up in the what is that? When is that going to happen? What is, you know, what is the mark of the beast? What is, mm -hmm. um, instead of flipping it over, because it says that those who know Jesus will have a mark given to them by the <clears throat> Lamb of God, who is Jesus. So the question is, who are those who will have the mark of the beast? The question is, will you have the mark of Jesus? Mm -hmm. And I just love that, like, because so often we focus on the negative rather than focusing on the Wait a second. I'm going to have the mark of Jesus. I'm going to have the mark of Jesus. Like Jesus is going to mark me with his number. Mm -hmm. And I find great comfort in that. I'm like, I am marked by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who takes away my sin. You know, because yeah. so often we can generalize that, well, the sins of the world. But no, he takes away my sin. Yeah. So I can be restored to relationship with God, which is what the whole Bible is about. Yeah. In that 
I'm going to stand, I'm going to be in those thousands upon thousands, right? And so I, you know, I read those numbers and I can get so upset. And yet I'm like, God, where's the hope in those numbers? And when you talk about standing with those thousands of thousands, you're talking about heaven, right? Yeah. That heaven's a real place. That heaven is a real place that real people are going to go to. And, uh, and one of the, I think one of the reasons why God uses stories is to get people asking questions of, well, whose side am I on? And am I going to be in heaven? Mm -hmm. Which is this wonderful, glorious place, which John talks about saying, there will be no more tears. There will be no more sickness, no more cancer, no more depression, no more abuse, no more, no more division, no more divorce. Dandruff. No more dandruff, Sorry, no more um, leprosy or skin diseases. Yeah. Uh, no more confusion in relationships. Uh, no more strife because there will be no more sin. Mm -hmm. There will be no more sin. And so Revelation is the story of how God is is giving people one it's like the curtain call one another chance to come to know him mm -hmm. another chance and so it's like i lay before you life and death choose life which is goes all the way throughout scripture all the way throughout scripture he says i lay before you life or death so choose life choose life and he, and and the book goes on to talk about judgments that are going to happen on the earth and one reason why I was kind of put off from reading it is because it, it seemed out of character for God initially when I read it. Man, mm -hmm. these are harsh judgments. Like, you know, part of the people, some people are going to die and people are going to be wiped out and it's going to be a terrible time. And yeah. I used to think, boy, that's the judgment and severity of God yeah. because He's holy and perfect and we can never live up to His standard. But then you said, when you were reading it, Jen, your perspective changed. That and I had this change of perspective as well, that when God allows judgment to happen, it's to give people one more chance. Yes. See, I'm serious, guys. I'm serious. You need to turn from your sin. This is real. Yeah. Like, and that was, because I'd never really thought about it before. Like, judgment, we often think, well, that's just God being mean. Well, actually, it's not. It's Him being true to His character. Like, in the sense that, he uses mercy to draw us, but he also uses judgment to draw people to him. Like, he is serious about what he says. Actually, you know, like in the book of Jonah, when Jonah was running away and he was on the boat and there was that crazy storm yeah. and the sailors who were there saw the power of God and what was happening to Jonah because he, he disobeyed. And God used that in His mercy to bring those sailors to Himself. Yeah. So kind of same thing, you know, this judgment's happening, but it's like one one more chance, guys, just one more chance. And yes. you quoted a, um, a verse to me earlier, Jen, I think it was in Peter, right? Mm -hmm. That God is not slow in keeping yes. His promises, as some understand slowness. But He is faithful, not wanting that anyone should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. Yes, that's Second Peter 3. Nine, the Lord is not slow in doing what He promised. Mm -hmm. The way some people understand slowness. But God is being patient with you. He does not want anyone to be lost, but He wants all people to change their hearts and lives. And what's interesting is often when I read through the Bible, um, if I read a verse, I'm like, oh, that's connected to this verse. But I, Ezekiel 18.23, so Ezekiel 18.23 says... I do not really want the wicked to die, says the Lord God. I want oh. them to stop their bad ways and live. That's Ezekiel. So, And then Isaiah 65, 2 says, hmm, Isaiah 65, 2, all day long I stood ready to accept people who turned against me. Yes, another version says, I hold up my hands to an obstinate people. The message of Revelation is God holding his hands out to an obstinate people. And that's the sad part, actually, is even though he's, you know, 
bringing his judgment because the thing is and and you get this idea that God is actually defending his people there because it says that he will defend us so his people are being wronged and hurt so he's actually rising up against the people that hurt his people and in so doing he's actually giving them another chance to repent right how mind-boggling is that that in his judgment people can be drawn to him right because he would relent if they turn and repent yeah yes and so dragons beasts and the glory of god is really in his judgment it is an opportunity for an obstinate people to come to know him which is his heart which is the hope the message of hope found in revelation Mm -hmm. last week we talked about jesus um, is the messenger it is true and worthy for the purpose of bringing hope to his people and here we are god uses symbols and beasts in order to draw people to him. That's the message of Revelation. He extends his hands for people to come and be in relationship with him so that they might be saved eternally and live with him. And that's good news. That is good news. (laughs) So why don't we just end in prayer, Jen? Yeah. Lord God, you are the almighty God who people will bow down and worship forever. And you extend your hands to an obstinate people to draw them to you. Lord, in our own personal lives where we show signs of being obstinate, would you reveal that to us and help us to repent so that we might have a fuller understanding of who you are, be drawn closer to you. And for those who have never, ever, ever even contemplating coming to you because they thought there's just no way. Would you reveal them yourself to them as standing arms wide open, ready to receive them no matter what? So Father, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to every person that's watching this show today and that they would sense your open arms are for them and would you cause them to come to you thank you Lord that you are a God of hope and despite the beasts and the dragons in our lives you're there extending your arms thank you so much in your name we pray amen amen well thanks again for tuning in to New Every Day. We do invite you to go to our website neweveryday.tv and any references we've made to different resources, you can certainly find that um, through our website. And I guess we'll see you next week. Please check us out on Facebook. Leave us a post. Tell us what you're thinking. Yeah. If there's something we can pray for you about, we'd love to do that. I agree. Until next time. Until next time.